Hey everybody on Facebook, Nathan's here. Yeah, Nathan. Uh, okay, so today is manufactured homes, irrigation, and solar. Today, this is the first class that's like this of many different subjects, and um, none of these seemed like a full class. So we've I've put them all together, and they're going to be kind of brief, brief versions of all of them. Enforce it. Okay. Turn on. So I figured out if you'd been watching any of the videos. Hey, Rhonda. Hey, how's it right there? I figured out how to sync the computer and unsync it. So now people don't have access to my, all of my passwords. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay, so manufactured homes is first on the list. Have you ever done a manufactured home? I haven't. There, there's a lot of trickiness that can be part of them, but they're not tricky in, in their own nature. So. Uh, let's look up, I want to find some pictures, UBC, hey Ian. How are you? Good. Good, what's going on? About to jump back in? Trying to, yeah. Good. So UBC stands for Universal Building Code. And what that means is that a home meets those guidelines. These are not, uh, let's see, let me, let me find, um, Modular home. So a modular, we have all kinds of different words we use when we're talking about homes that are not stick built. And really even a modular home is stick built. But like see this one here? That is a UBC modular home. It was built in a factory and moved in different pieces. Modular homes, this one is Somewhat more obvious, but this one is, is way less obvious. Look at that one. Should we turn the lights off? You want to, I, I'm going to be, there's going to be a lot of pictures on the screen. Oh, that's nice. So this is a modular UBC home. Um, uni universal building code. Uniform, uniform building code. There's a UBC home. But here's another UBC home. That looks more familiar, doesn't it? And that one, you can just see. It was brought in in two different pieces and, and put on its lot. The difference between a, universe, a UBC home, also known as a modular, and a manufactured home, is that a manufactured home had a motor vehicle title at some point. It had rails underneath it, that are probably still there, and then was brought in on wheels, on axles. The axles were removed after it was set on its foundation. A UBC home will almost always be on a, a permanent perimeter foundation that could be cinder block, but it most likely is also a poured concrete stem wall. A manufactured home will have like piers and tie downs. You were about to ask a question, Ian? I was just going to ask, so like with uh, modulars are the ones that are UBCs, right? Yeah. Okay. Modulars are so UBCs. Modulars would use the normal Colorado CBS, and with a manufactured, yeah, right? we'll, that's we'll talk about in, but we'd Sorry. use the other, the Let's Damien Cox one. Yeah, okay. Right? We're going to get into that in a sec. I wanted to talk about the differences between all of these. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, Rhonda, were you about to start to ask a question about we contracts? Have this issue, and there's the whole: is it a metal frame? Is it a wood frame? Is it a? Yeah. I mean, I was told like every time I get this client into a new home, yeah, there was a reason she couldn't have it. Right. The reason she couldn't have it, and it was all the modular things. And every time her, her mortgage lender would say something different. Every time I get her a new home, okay, it has to be a double wide. Okay, we'll get her a double wide. Then we get her that. Oh, but it 
it was moved or it was, I mean, it's, it's yeah. like four or five issues and I never did get her in one. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to talk about all those possible issues that can come up here. Uh, so manufactured home. So by the way, UBC, if it is a UBC, if it never had a motor vehicle title, if it is on a, a permanent perimeter foundation, and do you guys know what I mean by perimeter foundation? Like around the outside edge of it, not just Pierce. Uh, it'll finance like a site built home. So, always? I haven't found a situation where it won't. Okay. Do you know? Well, mine. One I was just but was it really a wood frame modular, or what? Did it have a motor vehicle title at some point? Uh, it was just. It literally. We'll talk about it later on. Okay. Yeah, it, it was every issue. I mean, they were like, is it this, is it that? Yeah. So that Which one was it? Let's look it up, Rhonda. Yeah. What was that? That might be underwriter, like lay, layover. Um, that, like, it's uh, like a you know, it, it's not for the loan type, but the underwriter has a problem with it. Right. Do, do you remember the address? One of them, no, but I probably can come up with the street name if I think for a minute. Let, okay. I think uh, it's still on the, the one is still on the market. And they said that they, you know. Well, let's just do a search, it. residential, and we can put in, take that out, type. Oh, by the way, it goes in just as single family. And then okay. uh, for, is it features? So like if we were gonna list one, we'd go single family. Yeah, let's see. And then under features, it's how built. So just what construction? There it is. Modular. Must have modular. Save. You think it's still on the market? We've got 16 here. Well, no, this, this is part of it. Okay. Um, I was gonna, we were going to look one up. Uh, and so, also, don't count on everything you see on the MLS. because I'm saying that because um, it looks like we have right here. I, this, okay, so this, this is in as a... Um, it's in as a modular. We, I'm looking for it, the field here. Do you guys see where it says modular on this report? I probably need to go to the all. There it is, right there, you're right. Yeah, so really this one shouldn't be in as a modular because this is a manufactured home. It should be in as manufactured. And we know this because of where it is. We know this, sub, uh, what's the name of this place? Um, Oh, now I forget. Midland Village. Midland Village is all manufactured homes. And you can see the skirting on it. This really shouldn't be in there like, right. like that. So anyhow, um, let's, let's go back to... Let's, so a manufactured home has a motor vehicle title. Just like an RV, just like a trailer, just like your car. It has a motor vehicle title. A modular never has a motor vehicle title. When a manufactured home gets brought to a piece of, of land, whether it's in a subdivision or whether it's you know, up on the Debec cutoff or wherever it is, wherever it's allowed to go, it can be placed there, put on permanent tie downs, and, and you can live in it. You can get a certificate of occupancy, hook it up to your septic and your water, or whatever systems you have. If you stop there, that manufactured home is still has a motor vehicle title. The manufactured home is not real estate yet. The land is real estate, but the home isn't. You have to do what's called purging the title. And what this refers to is taking the motor vehicle title from the state and purging it from the state system goes away. In order to do this, you have to get 
uh, an inspection of the foundation. You have to, uh, there's a lien search, there's searches with the treasurer, there's a process. And I was gonna pull one up of, of um, what an affidavit, you have to have an affidavit of real estate and you have to have a, uh, a VIN inspection. The VIN inspection is where the, uh, the title and the VIN of the home are, are matched. Um, a coma, a coma has it, has one. We did this on one just recently. I should have had this up before. Mm. So how do you get in touch with the start of getting it first? Yeah, so it's best if the title company you're working with is familiar with this because they'll drive, they'll drive that. Um, DMB. Here's, here's the affidavit of real property. Here we go, here we go, good. Download that, open that up. So this is the affidavit of real property. And you'll see on this form that the VIN number's on there, the serial number's on there. Um, it's been investigated, it's been signed off by uh, the assessor, it's been signed off by the treasurer. Um, and then this had to get sent to the DMV the VIN was, was looked at. There was a limited power of attorney to show that the people who were signing had the right to sign. You may not need that. So with this comes, a, we, we had to get a duplicate of the title because this was a bank owned and we didn't have the title. If you're dealing with an owner, they probably have the title. If they don't, you have to get a duplicate. Uh, failing doing this, uh, the property isn't technically real estate. The manufactured home is uh, personal property. And that's where we come into the question of Damien's form versus just using a CBS. If you find manufacture, a lot with a manufactured home on it and the manufactured home is purged, you just use a regular CBS. You don't have to do anything different. You don't need any special clauses because that manufactured home is just real estate. If you are selling that home in Midlands Village, the CBS doesn't do it. The state says we have the, we, we, our license allows us to sell manufactured homes. Um, rule E35, I think, allows us to do it. But because it's not real estate, the contract doesn't work and they say you have to have a a f you have to have a form prepared by an attorney to do it. So uh, it does come up. And we were talking about this with your, with, with uh, Carol. She's going to be doing one of these, huh? Uh, on the MLS, they should be in manufactured home. If you see really low prices, the first clue of a really low price is that it's a manufactured home on a rented lot. Also, you'll be able to see real quick the dues, uh, uh, the HOA dues are fairly high, 385 a month is the dues there. Uh, let's talk about, though, I wanna talk about appreciation. Because you'll hear that manufactured homes don't go up in value. And this one apparently has not. Look at that. Okay, so this one doesn't have any land. This manufactured home is, is not real estate. And in 2010, it sold for $30,000. 2000, in October of 2010, it sold for, what do we have here? We've got, we have two different MLS numbers. Somewhere in there it sold for 28 or 30,000. I think when it says BKS, oh, this is because it 
um, we transferred from Navica to Paragon. That's what happened there. Anyhow, it's sold, and it's losing value. Uh, let's see. Let's see if this one has previous history. This one's going up in value. Marianne sold it for 38 grand a year ago. Now they're, now they're trying to sell it for this. Yeah, Ian? Same address? Yeah. They're like different unit numbers? Yeah, this is 435, 32 road, unit number. You, oh, I, what you're so saying is that. The history. You think it's. Pulls up multiple units. All right. Well, let's. Land? Yeah, I got, I got, okay. I got you. Let's um, double check that. And I was going to make this point too. Um, 435, 32 road, number 206. I'm on the assessors. 435. 32 road. Look at all of, oh, look at all the ones that come up. Look at all the ones that come up. Let's look at 206. See, 435 32 road is the address for Midlands, Midland Village. For the whole village. Yeah, for the whole village. And the, oh, I, I went too fast, but that's okay. I can show you here. See this number here? Do you guys remember what, way back in real estate school what the lot, the parcel number signified? Each one, they all have it. All has a meaning. First four numbers are the township. Then this is a, a quadrant of the, of the block. Or no, it says which quadrant it's in, which block, um, another block number, and then the arbitrary parcel number. Mm -hmm. 2943, 2945, you guys have seen these numbers all over the place. But this one has a 7,000 number. And 7,000 is what the uh, county reserves for manufactured homes that don't have a location-specific parcel number. You see this one down here, associated parcel, 2943154. That is the parcel number of the land that it is sitting on. But this is for the manufactured home. So if you ever see a 7,000 number, that should be a trigger. Uh-oh, we're not purged. Let's go down and see, here we go, we've got, we've got some sales history here. Whoa, look at that. Yeah. Well, no, it won't be. Okay. It won't be. And that's why I was looking at these, because I wanted to talk about appreciation of manufactured homes. Um, we've got wild, wild transfers here. Wild transfers. Yeah, that was, that was a quick claim deed or something like that. Um, but look at this, 31, 38. The value of this one is all over the place. Uh, let's see what else there is. Let's just pick, pick this random one. Currently at 23,000. So not purged in this park, uh -huh. which would be all of them, Yep. would be sold more like a vehicle. Yeah, we can do them, but we have to use our special form. You don't have access to that form on purpose because we want you to come to us, okay. take a pause, we'll talk about the deal. Okay. Yeah. And that's not just PC people, that's everybody. Nobody has access to that form. I don't even have the form. I have to ask for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, actually we see this one going up in value a little bit over four months. That's a little wacky. It's all over the place on these. Uh, Funny thing though, like, I'll show you, a manufactured home, then it shouldn't matter where the lot is, right? Because you're buying only the home. But if we go into this MLS, we will find, I mean, oh, I should have done map. Over here in Elgebel, there's a, a trailer park. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, should I? We'll talk about that in a sec. <laughs> trailer park versus... So, so much of the words we use matter. Trailer park. I know. I said trailer park. Here's some closed. 
Here's one that closed July last year for 135. And it's an old, oh, what well, old is this? 912 square foot, uh, what year is it? A 2,912 square foot single wide for 135 because of where it's sitting. Right. Because of where it's sitting. And let's see if we can get so a good even history. Even though you're not buying that piece of land it's sitting on, you're living in El Chabot. Right. And it's, and it's there, and right. it's not it moved. Still of where yeah. you're living, and they, you're not getting the piece of land. And they still do go up in value if the market is going up. Well, so, we're for, you know, flipping trailers. Flipping trailers. Yeah, well, boy, that's... I saw a flip trailer on the interstate once. It was scary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so they do, they do go up. They depreciate faster from an IRS standpoint. From an IRS standpoint, this building depreciates over 40 years. A home depreciates in value 27 and a half years. And I think a manufactured home depreciates in value every for over 15 years. Meaning if you don't do anything to it, its value goes from what it is to nothing in 15 years. And that's from the tax code. So let's talk about moving them because Rhonda brought that up. If a manufactured home ticks all the boxes and it's, it's the right age, by the way, let's talk about age. I'll skip back to that one. Pre-HUD means 1976. It means that the manufactured home didn't meet any building guidelines. Uh, that's where you're going to find your two-by-two two walls. You're going to find you know, domed roofs. You're going to find just true trailer type stuff. The more and more we progress, the better and better they get. So after 1976 is not pre-HUD. You can't get any financing on pre-HUD. Really. I mean, you really can't. Uh, if it's been moved, though, you can't get financing. You can't get FHA financing. So one of the questions to ask is, is this a, its original site? Because if it was bought, moved out to one piece of property out in Mac, and then moved to another one in Loma, you can't get financing from FHA on its location in Loma. Be careful there. And VA go ahead. Twice? One of them's twice. Is one of them twice? VA might be. It could be moved once. But yeah. Might, on, its, on a second position, second yeah, spot. Lender, yeah, right? These, so yeah, on all of this stuff, guys, this, don't, don't take this as like the definitive rules, especially when it comes to lending, because those rules change all the time. They change all the time. And I'm not an expert on, on the loans. So if, um, if it's been moved, be very wary. Ask the lender about it. Ask the owner about it. Do that search. Um, what was the other point I was going to make about them and financing? Oh! This is just a personal opinion. I don't know that this is... <laughs> when rules change on loans and things that we can and can't do, you know, sometimes they get easier, sometimes they get harder. What I have found is that over the past 15 years, things seem to be getting harder for manufactured homes in that older era. Like, it's more likely that they're going to say, no, nope, we're not doing that anymore. So if a buyer can do it today, and they buy it, and they move into it, there's still a chance that in five years when they go to sell it, the lender is going to say, no, we don't do that anymore. I know that they did that, but we don't do that anymore. And one of those examples is a lot of the manufactured homes I've had uh, that we've taken back that are bank-owned, they had an FHA loan on them. They had an FHA guaranteed reverse mortgage. They met FHA rules in 1998. Today, the buyer goes to inspect the foundation to make sure it meets FHA guidelines, and it doesn't because the guidelines changed. So now new, new tie downs have to happen. I think the change was in 2000 or 2001. 
And, you know, if you, that may not apply to anything you're dealing with. But it seems like the rules change more for manufactured homes than stick-built houses. Let's see. Foundation inspection pre hood Oh, heads up on this one. It's hard to find an example these days, but they still exist, where um, the county had a parcel number for the land, and a 2943, and a 7,000 number for the manufactured home. The people moved the manufactured home onto the land, and everything was fine, but they were getting two tax bills. One tax bill for the manufactured home, and one tax bill for the, the land. And the land was being taxed at vacant land values. Do you guys know about that? Vacant land taxes are higher than our Constitution. Uh, quick, quick, quick aside on taxes here. Let's go to the county's website. Does anybody? So how do they deem it vacant if there's a manufactured home? Well, that's that's the point. That's the point I was about to make. Um, anyhow, we won't we won't look at a tax bill because it'll. I'll have to find a vacant land. Vacant land, the Constitution says, is taxed at its assessed value 28% of its actual value. Residential is roughly six or seven, depending on what Tabor does that year. So uh, residential taxes on a $200,000 house are a quarter of what they would be on a $200,000 piece of vacant land. Yeah. And $200,000 commercial property. And there's no depreciation on land. There's no depreciation on land. And we're talking about property taxes anyhow, not deducting it from your income taxes on IRS. So these people had a vacant piece of vacant land. They moved a manufactured home on it, getting taxed vacant land value and getting taxed on the value of the manufactured home. They said, hey, it's not vacant land, and we've got two tax bills. This is residential use now, because we're talking about use. It's, it's not vacant, and it's residential use. Give us that, those taxes. So the county said, all right, we will combine the two tax, the two parcel IDs, and you'll get one tax bill now. So it, it, this is less now, but back in the um, early 2000s, when we'd look at something on the assessor's site, it looked purged. It looked purged because we had this parcel number and it said, oh, there's that on it, that manufactured home on it. Right. But the titles weren't purged. They still existed. They were just combined. Through the late 2000s, most of those got purged. Just keep your, keep your eye out, just in case one is combined and not purged. It may look purged, but it's, it, it may not be. Uh, I think that might cover it. Just a little more conversation about that. what I said about trailer versus manufactured home. <laughs> really, remember when you're working with your buyers and they're now considering a manufactured home? Don't call it a trailer. That won't help them make their decision. It won't at all. And um, some manufactured homes are built better than site-built homes. They, they just are. They're built in a factory. Not a bad thing. Controlled circumstances. Higher quality materials. Manufactured homes aren't awful. Some of them are really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Clayton would be manufactured. Uh-huh. They trucked them in in pieces. And yeah. Go walk around. There's some really nice houses. Called yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and on that note, since this is about manufactured home, those outfits will very often pay you a commission. If you bring the buyer to them, you get a buyer agency agreement. You bring the buyer to them and say, hey, we're looking at doing, a, you know, we ha have a piece of land identified. We're looking at putting that on there. They'll very often pay you a commission for the whole value of the package, not, not just the land. So if someone's thinking of, of doing that, just like new construction. You don't just go find them the piece of land and then the contractor, and then they find the contractor. 
Anything else on manufactured homes? Yeah, I don't think so. All right, let's talk about irrigation water. Mm. Okay, so we've got all kinds of different districts. Anybody, can anybody think of any districts that they've ran into? Yeah. Uh, well, like in town, we have Grand Valley. Right. Oops. We have Grand Valley. We have two Grand Valleys. Redlands Water. Redlands Water. Orchard Mesa Irrigation District. I'm going to the gjcity.org slash maps site here. You can search city GIS. You can go to view city maps. This is an excellent GIS system. The city of Grand Junction was at the forefront. City of Grand Junction and Mesa County were way on top of GIS back in the 90s. Won many national awards for it. And you'll see here aerial photo. It used to be awesome. Like, oh my God. Now we, you know, Google Maps has really spoiled us on a lot of this stuff. Um, you can now uh, where is it? No, maybe not anymore. They change this so often. Huh. You used to be able to change the base map. So you could um, turn on the 1950s aerial photos, you which was. Can still. Can you? Uh, yeah, but I go to a different site than you are well, in right now. For the city's maps? For, uh, for which one do you go so to? I just Google Mesa County GIS. And That's. It's like the fourth link. Well, that, so that's Mesa County's. Oh, where do you look at? That's the city's. I was on the city's. They're, they're two separate systems. This is, yeah, Mesa Counties. Mesa Counties is good, too. They won some awards from Esri. Have you guys been to this? Yeah? Okay. No? no? This one is, is the Mesa Counties. And <clears throat> you can turn on the base lap. Yeah. They have... Oh, yeah, here we go. They've got 1954. Look at that. Look at that. So this is Sherwood Park. This is all that stuff around Sherwood Park. And this is Sam's Club. That's not what this class is about, though. <laughs> huh. Okay, so we're going to go to Utility Map for the city. Okay, layers, irrigation districts right here. Turn that on, and you get to see the irrigation districts. Who serves what? So starting at the top of the valley here, this is Palisade. This one is the Palisade Irrigation District. And if you click on the pink, it gives you contact info for Palisade Irrigation. If you click on the purple, it gives you contact info for Mesa County Irrigation. It used to be at one point these were administered by the same people, but it looks like not anymore. And that is um, Grand Valley Irrigation Company. So we've got four different water or irrigation districts right here, just in this view. Orchard Mesa Irrigation. And it all comes down to what ditch they're coming out of. So everything drains to the river, and this ditch right here is the Palisade Irrigation District ditch right there along that line. And there, all this goes down that way. What were you saying? Is your house right in there? Real close to there? <laughs> so then up here is um, the Clifton Ditch, Mesa County Irrigation District, and then here's another one. I can't remember the name of that one. It's got a person's name on that ditch. Anyhow, that's how you find those irrigation districts. Um, you'll see as you go down, Grand Valley spans out. 
and gets really big. A lot of what we're, we deal with is in the Grand Valley Irrigation District. The next uh, Grand Valley Irrigation Company's district, the next biggest one is Grand Valley Water Users. There's a big difference there, even though they both have Grand Valley in the name. Grand Valley Irrigation Company is a share company. Again, just like financing, call the, um, call the irrigation company to get the specifics on what is owned by that property. I just want you to know that this stuff exists. Share company. What that means is it is a company and you own shares in that company. You can buy them. I live in Carbondale. I can own Grand Valley Irrigation Company um, irrigation shares. Can't get them to my house, but I can own them. I can buy them. They're, they're for sale. They're available. What I, benefit with that? There's none. Okay. There's none. I, at one point, thought about buying some for speculation purposes, but because the, they're only like 300 bucks a share. Maybe they go up to five at some times, but they have a $250 a year maintenance fee. So how much do they have to go up in value to make any money? It's really only for the water users. So anybody can own shares, and that is a share that needs to be transferred from one person to another. It doesn't go with the property. If you own shares in that company, though, the point I just made, doesn't mean you can get it to your property you may need to have rights in a ditch company also that was created to convey the water from the canal half a mile down to your property. There may be a ditch that the water goes in to get to the property, and you may need to own those rights also. Your seller's going to know more about this. Just know to ask the question. Th maybe they bought it, the house 10 years ago and they were told all this and maybe they pay their bills and someone else takes care of all that. And when you ask them, it sparks their memory. And they're like, oh yeah, no, we do have a ditch company, don't we? Yeah, it's that uh, Harold, he's the, remember how you know, he came around and we wrote him a $50 check to take, care of, to take care of the ditch, that sort of thing. That's Grand Valley Irrigation Company. Grand Valley Water Users Association. This water, this, this project was created, was built by the government, by the federal government. And that water can't be moved. It can't be moved from one parcel to another. That's the same on all of those. Orchard Mesa. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true on Redlands now that I think about it. Yeah. It sells with it, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. So Redlands, Orchard Mesa, um, Palisade, and Mesa County used to be Clifton watered. Uh, those all can't be moved. They stay where they are. In fact, like my dad lives up on 24 Road, and he's got 20 acres that looks like this, and the top of his parcel is on the map with irrigation water. Just this area is the map that shows who gets what water. So he can move it to any, any part of his property. If, they had cut, if he cuts it off like that, cuts it into two parcels, this parcel doesn't have any rights to irrigation water. Only this one does because the map, the water district's map, shows that this part of his property gets irrigation water. Um, Wells, I want to talk about wells just a little bit. You guys probably won't run into it, but you may. There are different types of wells, and we're in irrigation water, so I'll talk about that. Um, there's what's called a domestic and a household well. Also, there's uh, irrigation wells. Let's look at, if you ever run into wells, you can go to the Colorado Department of um, resource, resources, well permit search. Here we go. That's applicable for a lot of uh, Glade Park. Right. Glade Park, Whitewater. Yeah. Um, what? There are a couple wells out in Whitewater. Not many. There are a couple. Uh... 
No results yet. I wanna. This is not. Hmm. Well, let's see. This isn't normally more options select. Ah, address. Um, boy. Let's see. White water, white water creek. You know what? There's no space in there, is there? There we go. Search. So we're going to go. This isn't the GIS one. Here's the GIS one. Yep, here it is. There we go. Okay. Here's all of Colorado, Mesa County. Let's go up on Glade Park because I know there's wells up there. You can zoom in. Let's see. There's DS Road. There's got to be a couple wells around here. All right, final permit. You got to turn that layer on. Huh. I really thought there'd be. Oh, there's one. There's an application. Doesn't look like it was. What's that? It could be, or it could be that it was never finalized. So they applied, they just didn't act on it? Yeah. Yeah. Or it, it, it could be, you're right, that it didn't, it didn't, um, didn't hit. It didn't, there's no water at it. There you go. Yeah, look at this. We've got a bunch of them here. <laughs> We've got a bunch of them here. Um, so I'm bringing this up now because beware of the domestic versus household well versus irrigation well. A domestic well will allow you to water a lawn or stock. The lawn is like, has to be under an acre and it'll let you water animals. If you have a household well, you can't water any animals. You can't have a garden. You're not allowed to have a garden. Of course, you know, if you water a garden, the water still goes outside, but you can get in trouble. So household and domestic is the same, irrigation? No, household and domestic are not the same. Household has to stay inside the house. Domestic allows some outside, very minimal outside. If you have a buyer looking, look these up so that they, and you know, print it out so that they understand what they can and can't do with that well. Irrigation wells, specifically, are for irrigation. There are some. That, oh, I just thought of where one exists. That's what I said. No, household, you can't. Domestic, yes. Yeah. Household, right. household stays inside the house. So household inside only. Domestic can be outside watering. Irrigation can be animals and plants. Yeah. Are, are you there, Christina? No, I'm somewhere else. What's the difference between household and domestic? Household well, you can only use the water within the walls of the house. So domestic is what? You, you, can, you can water st limited stock. Limited and limited outdoor irrigation. Does that make sense, Christina? Are you with me? So there's So if somebody is on a well for household, 
We run a well for household and water, our garden. Well, I, I, yeah, I also just said that the water, you can, you can do it, but it's not in the rules. You can lose your well permit. There's actual rules there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. See, the well, is, the well was one person's well that we received water off of. It wasn't, we didn't own the well. Yeah, I believe that. That's how it was. Yeah, and sometimes, so, sometimes there are shared well permits okay. where a community will own a well. That, okay, that, exists. that exists. Well, this one man. Just one nice guy who lets you use his water. Yeah, okay. I work well, I would go yeah. Meters, it was on well, he may have owned it then. He may have owned it, and he may have had permission to do that. Okay, I would, that's yeah. What I was asking, yeah. Yeah. Like like yeah. That's yeah. I, I, I sold a house in '17 that was on a. I think there were six or seven people in that subdivision that had access to one well. Right. Okay. Yeah. The artesian. The artesian well. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, er, Ariane, did you have, you were going to say something. I was just curious if there was like, I mean, you kind of just touched on it, like a multi-purpose well, like where you could. Yeah, there are. Allocate domestic household and irrigation. Mostly, you, yes, that does exist also. Mostly, though, you see a domestic and a household. Okay. That's usually what you'll see. Um, this right here, these folks. That center pivot's on a well. It's one of the only center pivots out there. They're, it's high up on a bluff, so none of this irrigation water could get to them. And so they're on a well, an irrigation well. Where's that? Mac. There's the Mac Airport. Oh, yeah. There's Highline. Yeah. It's, well, this is Richard Rausch's mom. <laughs> and, and Charlie's mom? Yeah. yeah, right? Yeah, I figured you'd know Charlie. Yeah, okay, so actually I think she died. So oh. that might be Charlie's place now, yeah. She was old. Oh, okay. She was old. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that you were talking about his mom. Well, his mom owned it. Right. And I think Charlie has it now. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> And I said, I wonder how he's doing. And you said, oh, no, he his, his mom did. I'm pretty sure his mom <laughs> so did. Okay. <laughs> All right. Right. Okay. So on this point, since we got to wells, um, I want to make the point about the source of water, mm -hmm. the source of water amendment, addendum, and why it exists. Remember, you don't need a source of water addendum if you have the seller's property disclosure filled out with the water information in there. If they do a seller's property disclosure but don't put the water in there, you need a, a source of water addendum. The source of water addendum was created because Highlands Ranch, South Denver there, at one point in the 90s came around to all of the residents and said, hey, we need $4,000, $5,000, something like that. Uh, why? Oh, the well ran dry. You're going to run out of water soon. We've got to go deeper. <laughs> they said, our well? No, we live in a subdivision with our houses 15 foot apart. We don't have a well. They said, yeah, your water comes from a well. Our realtor never told us that. They said. So now we have that addendum. So everybody knows where their water comes from. Because sometimes a person owns the well. Sometimes the subdivision owns the well. And if the subdivision owns the well, people may think that, oh, we just have, it's just treated water, irrigation water. But no, the subdivision owns a well, and they need to know, is that aquifer going to run out? Is, you know, what's the flow rate of that aquifer? Blah, blah, blah. Just like you would on any other well. That's why we have that, that document now. Um, all right, I have solar on the agenda. We'll just do quick, since it's six minutes to 11. Solar. Old 1970s stuff, hot water, heated, you know, sun heats the hot water, it circulates into a house. I saw 
I saw a house with this just two weeks ago. Still old system, works fine, and just heats water before the hot water uh, heater and the boiler heat the water. So it's not heating cooler water, it's heating warmer water, uses less energy. People own those, those were never any big deal of, of ownership. What are those called? Hot water, ther what are they called? Thermal, solar, thermal, solar, okay. thermal, solar. Okay. Now, the, the solar that we hear about these days, nobody's really doing hot water solar. What, what we have is photovoltaic solar, solar turning, creating electricity. You may also see PV. Photo, photo, photo just means light, it's Greek for light. Voltaic. V-O-L-T-A-I-C, photovoltaic. That's what the electric creating solar panels are. They have a little cell in them. Light excites electrons, moves it through the, through the wires. It's that simple. I don't know why they can't make it easy. Oh. <laughs> so um, a lot of companies sell solar panels to owners. Some owners write a check, put them on their house, get a HELOC, put them on their house. They buy them. They own them. Some companies have financing for the solar panels, separate from the financing for the house. If that exists, when you list one or when you have someone buying it, it needs to be clear, are you paying off this debt? when we buy this house. And that comes, that there's a place in the contract for that. Doop, doop, doop. Let's do, I know there's, yep, I have it. In the contract here. We talk about um, inclusions, other inclusions. Um, see this one here, 2.5.3? Conveyance. Any personal property must be conveyed at closing by seller free and clear of all taxes, except personal property taxes for the year of closing, comma, liens and encumbrances except. We're conveying the personal property which is the solar panels to you, free and clear of all liens except for this lien. The balance of whatever is owed. Right, yeah. And in that case, the buyer is assuming that debt that the seller has. What type of verbiage would you put in there if they had a lease on the solar panel? I would document it by saying, you know, um, balance owed per contract dated. Okay. Yeah. There you There's a solar panel check box up above. Yeah, for the inclusion. Yep. Right there. And this one, um, yeah. You would check that. So you would check that and then go into 2.5.4 to describe it. Describe what the debt is. This is where you document the personal property being transferred. This is where you document what the debt is, is going to be. This, in dot loop, this is a tiny little, tiny little hole to put stuff. CTME lets you put a paragraph in there if you want, and it just spaces it all down. If you need to say it, say, see Exhibit A, or something like that, however it's documented. Uh, so I have had listings, not transactions, I've had listings that had um, solar panels that still had quite a bit of a balance on them. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get anybody to buy it. Nobody wanted to do it. They ultimately rented the place out and it's been rented for years because nobody wanted to take on $28,000 worth of debt for solar panels. And the funny thing is, is the debt for the solar panels versus the cost saving for having them was huge. It was a net positive, but everybody looked at it as 
why would we take on their debt? The debt servicing was like half of what the cost savings were, though. Did you come up against anything like with a lender? Um, Saying, no. No, we're not going to assist this. Like, well, see that. The sellers, say the buyer's okay. Yeah, I, I see the benefit. Yeah. Can the loan people come in and say, um, no, we don't? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, if let's look at. Uh, it was a $300,000 house, and it had, let's say, roughly $25,000 against the panels. That, the solar panel debt was not factored into the loan for the, the mortgage. The mortgage, you know, was going to be 20% down of three hundred, And the buyer would buy it and assume the debt on the panels. The lender didn't have to escrow for the debt for the panels. The lender didn't have to um, pay off that balance and roll it into that lend. So they didn't have any so really concern didn't. with it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they didn't have anything to do with that. It would be like if there was a home security system and you were taking over somebody's two-year contract or one-year contract to pay for that. It, so, yeah, they didn't have anything to do with it. It wasn't mortgage. It was the people not wanting to take on the debt for the, the solar panels. And does it automatically transfer, like let's say it's a $200 a month fee for that solar panel for the next five years, that automatically transfers with the... Not automatically, no. There's, you have to... They have to re -get They have to apply with the... Okay. Be credit worthy with the solar panel company. Right. So again, another downfall to them going, I don't want to do that. Right. I don't want to mess Yeah. It, you know, they would have had to have... And it would show up on their credit report that they had this payment. And, now there's a payment in the debt. Yeah. Wow. So it's truly separate. Yeah, it is. Can it's, you remove them? It's attached. You can remove them. Okay. Yeah, you can. And I suppose the sellers could have had someone wrench them off and take them to their new house. But then what kind of roof damage? Right. I was going to say, then you got roof stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't really a viable option. And you know, the thousands of dollars to hire someone to do that yeah. just didn't seem. So beware, beware. That, the minute you see solar panels on a house, the first question is, do you own, the, own those? Yeah, yeah. Are they leased? Well, and, and I didn't talk about leased yet. Leased, you don't own things. You don't own leased things. Right. You just have a rental agreement for them. So yeah, are they owned? Are they leased? If you own them, is there debt associated with them? Yeah. Right, so because a leased thing you don't own, right. and will never, unless there's, unless unless there's something in the lease that says you have to buy it at yeah. the end of mm -hmm. the period, right? Right. I really hadn't thought of those being really separate. I just always thought if they're leased, eventually they're owned at the. But I guess that's more financing. Right. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Fine print. Fine print. All right, I'm going to check questions. Trisha, this was great, Travis. We can talk next week. Lots of us happening. Okay, Trisha, you probably can help us out with solar panels a lot, too. Um, you need to apply for... Uh, we'll talk about that. Okay, I'm going to end this. Thanks, guys.